kingdom. You've been announced. Please join us on stage. Back to the future, a new era of conflict in Europe. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs from Ukraine, Ambassador Bala Venkatesh Verma, former Ambassador of India to Russia, and Moderator Amrita Narlekar, Honorary Fellow, the Darwin College at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Narlekar, are we all set? Thank you so much. Over to you. Hello, good morning, namaskar, um, many thanks, first and foremost to Samir Saran and the team for organizing another great Raisina Dialogue and uh, a very warm welcome to all of you on this third day of the conference and it's great to see so many of you here. Our session today, as you can see, is called Back to the Future, a new era of conflict in Europe and there's a question mark there. And I don't think we need a question mark because it's been two years, almost to the day, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that war has continued. Europe is no longer a zone of peace. The transatlantic alliance is needed more than ever during these testing times, and yet we know that it is also facing severe challenges. The need for global cooperation is great, but the global south, as you are aware, has been hesitant to become party to what many countries see as a European conflict. Instead, the global south is seeking ways to mitigate the spillover effects of the war. And amidst, amidst all these changes, the EU and its members and its member states are having to rethink, reconsider, reflect uh, on their own roles. Now, what, the, on their own roles and in, uh, in terms of being military players, in terms of security players, in terms of geopolitical players, in terms of geoeconomic players, right? So Europe is undergoing a very serious self-reflection process. Um, as these changes occur within and outside. Now we have with us today a distinguished panel with speakers who are very well equipped to help us better understand the problems and hopefully also explore innovative solutions. Write a new script together for the future. We're going to have two to three rounds of questions and uh, our esteemed uh, panelists have agreed to be brief because there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, and, uh, and we want to make sure that you are able to engage as well, dear members of the audience, and to ask your questions. So short and succinct is how we will keep it and cover vast ground together. So round, and I will go in the, in, in, in the order this way, yes? Uh, moving this way, if that's okay, yeah? All right, um, so uh, let me start off by inviting the panelists uh, to share their assessment of the situation in Europe today since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and especially in a world where there is so much disinformation and there is the availability of instruments through which this disinformation can spread fast. You have facts on the ground. Please give us your assessment. Over to you. Minister. Thank you very much. If we, we are running out of time already now, so yeah. I will be very short and, and precise. You know, everybody is talking about the uh, <coughs> Russian war in Ukraine or in Ukraine war, but actually we have to name, we have to define what it is. And of course, uh, Ukrainians, they have really fought it well, and the meaning of uh, Putin had an idea about the special operation for the six days. 
May I ask you to come closer to the mic, okay. please? Okay, Thank I you. hear what I'm, I'm talking about. You don't hear me. So uh, instead of uh, six days of special operation, what Putin planned, now we have like uh, two years full-scale war with all the horrible things. And it is not just a military conflict. We know that more than 20,000 kids have been deported to Russia and all the awful things what has happened. But uh, let, about the fake information and false information, we have to understand globally what it is. It is not just a military conflict, and it is not just like the arguing uh, about the borders, which is part of that. But uh, it is what Putin has said publicly. Putin has said already years ago what is his plan, restoration of imperium. So this is, Russia wants to get back lost colonies. This is exactly what it is. And it didn't start like two years ago. It started already with Georgia 2008. Georgia is partly occupied. And with Ukraine, it started 2014. And now it's full-scale war ongoing. And how we see from our perspective as a bordering country, and we were occupied 50 years from Soviet Union as well, is that uh, Russia wants to get back the colonies. They want to get back as well Baltic states. They want to get back Poland. They want to get back Finland and so on. So this is why we have to focus on uh, putting the right names to the things what we see. Actually, Russia is gaining back the colonies. So that's the reason as well we have to understand that uh, there cannot just be some kind of peace agreement as we had 2014-15, because it will be repeated. And the other way around, Putin is in, in, in war. He has changed all the society in the meaning of fighting the most bloodiest war about uh, no freedom of thought. Navalny message, killing Navalny was a very clear message to the Munich uh, Defense or Security Conference that I can do whatever. So if we are talking here in India about uh, the Russian aggression, so this is aggression against everything, against our democracies, and it touches us all. So the situation is like this, that the most efficient way, the most cheapest way for Europe is to support Ukraine, is to, to support Ukraine militarily, that they can fight for their freedom, for our freedom, but also as a bordering country, I can say, and as I was defense minister 2016-17, we saw the other side of the border, 120,000 troops ready to go from Russian side. These troops are not existing, literally. They have mostly sent to Ukraine and not existing. So we have to understand as well the will to gain back their uh, co colonies, the territories, is there and will remain there because Putin cannot stop, because he's a warlord now. Okay. And if he, if he stops, he's out from Kremlin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister. Uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Estonia, that's a very clear statement. Um, let me now pass on to you, uh, Ambassador Venkert. Um, perhaps you would care to respond and also give us your assessment. Thank you. Uh, this is, of course, an assessment from afar. Ambassador, would you move your mic closer to you because it's being recorded? Yeah. So this is an assessment, of course, we are giving from afar, from, from India. Uh, this has been a war of surprises. Uh, it began as a war of maneuver. It's now a war of stalemate, of attrition, of exhaustion of military resources. But it's a stalemate that is seen as moving in Russia's favor, marginally. Is it an irreversible Russian military advantage? I don't think so. There are many imponderables in the conflict. Uh, Ukrainian resistance is still very strong. Uh, European support, uh, $52 billion, was put together. European unity on Ukraine is still strong, but it is taking more and more effort to put that unity together. Uh, NATO unity is there. Uh, there is a debate in Washington that is uh, brewing to an extent. Uh, that we will wait to see. NATO has been expanded, but ne not necessarily uh, leading to uh, enhancement of its capabilities, uh, huge shortfalls in its defense, in its uh, commitments. Uh, NATO is very, very uneven. Uh, those countries sitting on the panel have all crossed the 2% uh, of GDP. The United States does 3.49%. Poland does 3.9%. Uh, 
Estonia does 2.73 percent, Latvia does 2.2 percent, uh, Romania does 2.44 percent, all of them above two. Uh, but you have also have uh, France, which is 1.9, Germany 1.57, uh, Spain 1.28, and the very far away but most uh, vociferous on Ukraine, Canada does 1.38. A long way to go in terms of NATO capabilities. Uh, the debate in Washington, I think, is interesting. Uh, it's very important. Uh, we can come back to that in the, in the, in the next uh, round of questions. But there is a debate on, in Washington on how much Europe should do for itself, including in the context of Ukraine. Um, the net result is that uh, both sides are waiting for a decisive breakthrough on the battlefield, which is not coming through. Ukrainian war aims are still absolutist, uh, return of Russian territory, reparations, um, uh, the International Court of Justice and international accountability in terms of international law. Russian war aims are uh, denazification, demilitarization, and the incorporation of the four provinces that uh, Russia has claimed as part of its territory. So the prospects for immediate peace are slim. Uh, we need to see this through. There is a larger disequilibrium taking place. I think the political economy of Europe is changing dramatically. The era of uh, cheap Russian gas, uh, ample Chinese markets, and cheap American security, that era is over. Uh, Europe needs to reboot. The disequilibrium on the international stage, a weak Russia and an overextended the United States works to China's advantage. That is a matter that we watch very carefully here. Europe is entitled to its outrage. I think there is understandable reasons for that, but outrage is never a basis for policy. And I think we need to see how uh, Europe looks at Russia in the long, medium, and long term. We still need to hear a coherent, long-term view on Russia. Uh, Europe is entitled to its uh, strong feelings on Russia, uh, but Europe is not entitled to its own facts of geography. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador Venkat. Uh, now let me hand the floor over to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania, Ms. Odobescu, over to you. And would Good you morning. move your mic much closer to you? Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Uh, let me start by recalling the facts. So two years ago, Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia invaded uh, a sovereign country, our neighbor. This was uh, unexpected, unjustified, unnecessary act of aggression. This is an act um, that points uh, to uh, imperialistic views of Russian leadership uh, who believes that, uh, I don't know, territories uh, of a sovereign state um, can uh, be taken over um, under the excuse that uh, at a certain moment in history they were under Russian uh, dominance. Yes, unfortunately, the war is back in Europe, and we are all affected by this. We couldn't stay and doing nothing. We had a moral responsibility to act because doing nothing helps the aggressor, the oppressor, never the victim. So it was our moral duty to help Ukraine, also replies to the history lessons, and um, our obligation to support our neighbors. And yes, Romania is directly affected. Uh, the, we have the longest uh, land border with Ukraine. It is our neighbors. We face uh, over six million of refugees crossing the border with Romania. The, the war is practically for 500 meters from, from the, far from the Romanian borders. When Russia attacked the infra, civilian infrastructure and the storages over the Danube, practically is five 
100 meters far from Romania. And we had, since September, five incidents with Russian drones which hit the Romanian territories. And unfortunately, the Black Sea is not anymore a peaceful sea because we have a war in the Black Sea. Mines are floating in the Black Sea. And this is why it's so important to exactly say this. Yes, the war is back in, in, in Europe. We didn't expect, but we have to help Ukraine. Because now we are going back to an era we thought uh, it was far away behind. So this is the situation in Europe now. This is why it's so important to, to help Ukraine. And you know, um, because when someone has this kind of uh, attitude and ambitious, you know, someone else, uh, state or non-state actors, are watching carefully. And why not me next time? So this is very serious. It gives reasons to others to act in a similar way. This is why it's our responsibility to support Ukraine. And this is what my country did and will continue to to do it until Ukraine's victory. It's important because this war is not only about uh, Ukraine. It is uh, about our principle, about uh, our uh, uh, values, uh, about the fact that uh, our neighbor was attacked over the night. So this is why it's important to explain to our partners what is the situation, what are the consequences on all of us, Okay, As I, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, so that, again, um, we've heard normative reasons, we've heard strategic reasons, we've heard a very, a, very, a very personal account of how close the war is to the country of, 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 of to Romania in this case, right? And, and so now let me, I think it's very opportune now to hand the floor over to you, the Deputy Minister of Ukraine, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, being a Ukrainian, it's, um, you know, tough to, to talk about the war in Ukraine because we take it very personally. Again, will you move closer to the yeah. mic? Uh, yes, and um, uh, I just want to say that it's not the two years of Russian aggression. We can see the ten years uh, because we are counting the aggression since the, uh, 2014 and the occupation of Crimea. It's that the last two years we have full, uh, full uh, unprovoked aggression of that high intense. Uh, but what are the facts? I will add some facts to that. So after, the two, year, after two years, uh, Ukraine is still fighting. We are standing. Yes, we uh, recently lost um, a little bit territories because of the shortage of ammunition and air defense and other type of weapons, uh, but it's tactical. Uh, in general, uh, in 2022, we liberated almost 50% of the recently occupied territories. It, in 2023, uh, we considerably diminished uh, Russian ability to maneuver in the um, uh, Black Sea, and uh, therefore we secure the Grain Corridor, uh, because uh, around 400 million uh, billion people around the world depends on Ukrainian grain, and we are still providing it. So despite the war, we are still contributing to the world food security. Uh, total damage in Ukraine because of the war is approaching to 500 billions already, but yet we are doing a lot of reforms and very soon the negotiation on uh, EU membership will be uh, opened. Uh, there are a lot of human lives. Uh, I would not speculate on the number of civilians, but believe me, this is dozens of thousands. Uh, Russian army lost already uh, 400,000, more than 400,000 uh, personnel in Ukraine. 
So they just, you know, uh, I think that Putin is just a butcher of his own uh, people. Uh, the coalition or solidarity around Ukraine is still solid. Uh, 54 countries are, pro uh, are providing us with weapon uh, assistance. Even more countries help us in humanitarian way uh, or financially. So I think, um, I think that there are all the preconditions for liberating all Ukrainian territories. Uh, of course, condition that we have all the weapons we need. Uh, what happened next? Um, you know, some voices are calling for negotiations. Uh, and, you know, we have our vision of it. Uh, it's Ukrainian peace for formula. And uh, I think that, and we believe that this is the just uh, way to, to settle this, uh, this war. Uh, it will give us a sustainable and, and long-term peace and just one, that is for sure. Therefore, uh, we are organizing the Global Peace Summit in Switzerland together with Swiss colleagues, where we are inviting all the you know, peace-loving nations to sit with us and to elaborate the uh, norms on which this peace should be established. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine. Uh, and you have the final word in this first round, uh, Foreign Minister of Latvia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, imagine you're living on a street and you're looking out the window and you see in your neighbor's apartment someone hits out the window and is going in. They're going to rob the apartment. Uh, so what do you do? So there could be a number of reactions. Maybe someone is uh, young and healthy and strong. They run outside and they, they try to stop the person themselves. Maybe someone doesn't feel that they're that strong. They take the phone and they call the police. Maybe someone doesn't have a phone or the phone is, uh, it, the battery is dead. So you open your window, you start shouting, hey, stop that, stop that. Maybe someone else uh, has a dog and, and tells the dog to, to, to uh, bark and bite. And maybe someone else says, oh, it's not my apartment. I don't do anything. And what we have in Ukraine is a very simple situation. Russia is violating every possible international law. Uh, in an inhumane way, trying to annihilate a neighbor. And what we are doing in the world is one of the above. So some feel big and strong, and they are uh, trying to help in a, in a very serious way, giving weapons. Maybe others don't have the big weapons, but they have the money, so they're giving the money. Uh, maybe others don't have so much money, but they give uh, the support, they condemn Russia, so votes in the United Nations, for example. And I think that what we have to understand is that the war in Ukraine is not only concerning Russia and Ukraine, which to many countries may seem very far away. Ah, it's not my apartment. But what it is, it's a very fundamental principle of the way of life which many of us enjoy because of international law under the UN Charter. And then the question is, do we think it's important to uphold international law and to stand up for Ukraine so that they can win and get the thief out of the, of the, uh, the bedroom? Or do we say, ah, let's let international law slip there, it won't affect me. And my message is, unfortunately, it will. In one way or another, the ripple effect will affect everyone in this room, every country around the world. So what we have, I think, is a, is a civic duty as people coming from countries that believe in the rule of law, in international law, to do everything in our ability to help Ukraine. So my country, we give weapons, we give money, we give humanitarian aid, 1% of GDP. For my people, it's not a question, but everyone can do something, because the only real solution is that Russia loses the war. 
Now, from Russia's point of view, it's a little bit like the child putting the hand in the cookie jar. So you put your hand in the cookie jar, you take the cookie, it's a big cookie, and you can't get it out, but you don't want to let go of the cookie because you like the cookie, but you can't get it out. So they made a, a military misjudgment, a fatal misjudgment. They thought they would go into Ukraine. Putin was told, very easy, three days, three weeks, in, out, done. Not taking into one consideration, maybe the Ukrainian people thought differently. And they did. And their heroism is something that, you know, songs will be sung in, in a thousand years about this. Uh, and they've run into a real problem. But Putin also feels that he can't just pull out, you know, surrender, so to speak, easily. Because then at home, he's built his political career not as a Democrat, but as an autocrat strongman. And if a strongman is not strong, then who is he needed for? So, unfortunately, it's only by helping Ukraine push Russia out that this can be resolved. Okay, thank you very much, Foreign Minister. So now I will um, sort of perhaps move in this direction back, uh, you know, from you. And, and I'm going to combine two sets of questions because uh, all of you from the Baltic states have made a very clear case on why there has to be pushback. Right? Uh, there are good, uh, if, if you've talked about democracy, you've talked about international law, you've talked about strategic concerns on your borders and the ripple effects. Right? And we've also heard from Ambassador Venkat how the world has changed, that this conflict is not going to end anytime soon, and oh, NATO, yes, it's expanding, but there are problems within NATO. So I'm going to combine two sets of questions. You pick and choose what you would like to cover. Again keeping your answers succinct so that we can get answers, questions from the audience as well. And my questions are, so my two questions are, first, we are seeing the problems on securing more funding. Now, even in the Biden administration, right, the 60 billion looks like it was going to go through, then the House uh, Republicans say, no, they don't want to vote on this, under the Biden administration, right? And then we've heard what Trump had said last week and before, right? So what if Trump wins? You know, how, what, what can Europe do in a world where many members, and especially the most powerful member of NATO, is seriously questioning its own commitment? So that's the big NATO question, and what can EU do about it, and what can your countries do about it? The second question is the Global South. Right? And here, we know there are divergent views, and you've made a case for why everyone should stand up for this. But these are also countries that have very immediate concerns too, such as food security, such as energy security, least developed countries. Right? Um, so in terms of the global south, uh, what, what idea, maybe share one idea on how you might win hearts and minds in the global south. Just one idea from you each. Okay, over to you. Um, well, one, uh, in, in terms of the global south, um, this war uh, can be understood very simply as a war of colonialism. Uh, Russia is still an imperial power, uh, whether we want to admit that or not. And they view Ukraine as their birthright, so to speak. They have a right to, to this territory. They deny the Ukrainians are a separate people, a separate language, a separate culture, a separate identity, and they're willing to kill all of them to prove the point. Uh, and uh, this, uh, we've seen this, uh, uh, you know, many countries know this from their own history. Well, this history is still living, unfortunately, in Russia today, and the object right now is Ukraine, but that, that's, that's the way uh, I see this. Regarding um, NATO, these are very <laughs> difficult questions to try to put together. But, uh, see, Russia was preparing for this war and was ready to gear up its war industry, its, its manufacturing and everything else. In Europe, we've been living very peacefully, um, um, some of us getting a little round in the belly because of the good life, and not really thinking about war as a real consideration. Two years ago, uh, you know, two years and one week ago, 
there are many uh, European heads of state, I, I was the prime minister at the time, uh, who uh, simply did not believe that war would actually break out. The buildup of the, no, no, somehow it'll, it will work itself out with the assumption that Putin has the same calculus that we have, that peace is a value in and of itself. Well, that was a fatal error. And Putin caught us a little off guard, having underinvested in our own collective defense for many years. This is being res resurrected, it's being corrected right now. So Europe, we're a little bit behind the curve. So many of us are now spending at least 2%, but our defense industry, producing weapons and ammunition that we can help also to send to Ukraine, this is still not, shall we say, on a war footing, but it is in transition from a peace footing to a war footing. But we will get there. And uh, in terms of NATO in the future, well, we will have to have a long-term, at least a 20-year deterrence against Russia, because even after this war, we will still have Russia as a problem in Europe, because it will not be reforming. I see no, no, no signs of that anytime soon. But in terms of the transatlantic relationship, uh, many U.S. administrations uh, have actually, I, I think, a valid point. In Europe, we are actually quite wealthy. Uh, we should be investing more in our own defense, being a bigger, um, shall we say, a bolster, a booster to NATO, because after the Second World War, many countries maybe got used to the fact that sort of it was a given that uh, U.S. did security and Europe did prosperity. Uh, and uh, now uh, Europe is also understanding that prosperity is only uh, there when you have security. So you have to invest in that as well. It is being done. It's happening slower uh, than, than the Ukrainians need, slower than what I would want. But we are making this transition. We have to keep our eyes open that for the next, say, 20 years, Europe will have to spend much more on its defense, which will be uh, politically difficult because that will mean a little less money for schools, for, for hospitals, for police, for everything else, or a little higher taxes. And I have not yet met anyone who likes the idea of higher taxes, so it would probably mean wiser spending. But we have to do this, and, and I think we, we have to pick up our weight okay. because we actually are more than capable of doing this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Karens. Uh, and I'd like, one of the, you, you said a lot of, in, you gave us a lot of interesting ideas, but one of them is also how Europe got into, got into the habit of thinking, we do prosperity, the US, you do security. But we're also in a world of geoeconomics, weaponization of interdependence. And we saw the costs of this when we in Europe tried to disengage from Russia on energy. Right? So in your comments, if one of you wants to pick up also on the uh, interdependence, weaponization of interdependence question, please feel free to do so. Over to you, the Deputy Foreign Minister. Thank you. In terms of the global south, actually Ukraine has learned its lessons. You know, we are now kind of paying for our previous you know, being too Eurocentric and not that known to the countries of the global south, due to many reasons, especially due to the lack of resources to go all over the world. But <clears throat> we are working right now very intensively on um, trying to, to reach to those countries uh, in Africa and Latin America and Asia, um, Arab countries uh, especially. Uh, you know, the idea is to show them our added value. So what Ukraine could do for them or what we could do together. So it's not only about, oh, please help us with Putin. No, 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 it's, it's not like that. We are, for example, a grain from Ukraine initiative. So this is actually, uh, you know, the providing grain to, Ukrainian grain to the countries in need on the brink of the humanitarian crisis and providing it for free. And yet we are still in war and we are capable to do this. And uh, I think that around 22 billion ton of, of grain from Ukraine initiative, uh, grain from this initiative war, <coughs> sent to the African countries, several African countries last year. So we continue. So we have this added value for them. We, we um, you know, have something that we could uh, provide. Uh, that for 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 the, these questions and um, uh, election in the U.S. Okay, let's see 
when the dust of election sit down, let's see what happens. Because um, for now we have uh, bipartisan support in the USA, you know, from both uh, Democrats and, and Republicans, and it's good. Uh, yes, of course, there is some problem with this uh, package of aid, and we are <clears throat> impatiently waiting for it. Uh, but I would like to remind you then, uh, at his first term, uh, tr it was Trump or Trump administration who unlocked uh, the lethal weapons to Ukraine, and then uh, the you know, provi provision of lethal weapons to Ukraine, and it was Trump, not Obama administration, and it was Trump administration. Or, um, or his, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was Trump administration who actually facilitated the Crimea declaration or so called Pompeo declaration that actually uh, reiterated that Crimea is Ukraine and, and so on. So, I mean, let's see what happened. Uh, I would not speculate on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Minister. Well, uh uh, in line with what my Latvian colleague said, before the war, I mean, Would we you were move up closer to the before uh, the war, we were as Europeans uh, very naive in our relation with Russia. I mean, we were uh, completely depending on Russian gas. Uh, we negotiated the Minsk agreement. Uh, we should remember that we also commemorate this month's 10th. Uh, uh, 10 years uh, since Russia in, um, invaded U uh, Crimea. So we focused uh, on other issues like recovery after p pandemic, uh, energy transition, climate change, a lot of other issues, not, anymore, uh, not on security issue. And we realized with the war that we have to strengthen the security, in, especially in the eastern flank. This is why we discussed and agreed in uh, NATO summits to strengthen the defense and deterrence on the eastern fla flank and also to reduce the gas uh, uh, dependence on, on Russia. It was not easy, but guess what? We did it. No, and uh, we are less and less dependent on Russian gas. So we can do it. I'm a firm uh, believer in the transatlantic uh, uh, relation because I think Europe needs uh, US and US needs Europe, like um, a strong partnership. Because we, at the end of the day, we have uh, the same objectives. And uh, we have a common history, we have the same values, uh, and we have to work together. It's the same with so-called um, Global South. I mean, we face the same challenges. Uh, it's not us and you. It's uh, uh, everything. Wh what's happened uh, happens in Europe affects other parts of the world, including Indo-Pacific. What what happens in Indo-Pacific affects Europe. We are living in the globalized world. Um, yes, Ukraine is geographical in Europe, but we all suffer the consequences of this war. I'm speaking in terms of energy security, with the increase in prices, with the, um, food security as well. Look what Russia is doing, attacking systematically the storages and the civilian infrastructure, not allowing Ukraine to export food. And this is why Romania is committed to help Ukraine, practically with, with the support of European Commission and US and other partners, we put in place a system, so-called solidarity lanes, to help Ukraine to transit um, the cereals. More than 23 million um, tons of cereals have transited Romania to the countries in need. So, we, we face the same challenges. We okay. face the yeah. same consequences yeah. of the war, irrespective where we are geographically located. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Ambassador, in the interest of time, Ambassador and uh, Minister Marcos, may I request you, uh, Ambassador, perhaps you could address the Global South question, and um, uh, Foreign Minister Marcos, perhaps you could take on the NATO question in a minute and a half each. Yeah, I'll Thank be quick. Uh, the longer the Russia-Ukraine war 
uh, continues prolonged, it is not in India's interest, absolutely. Uh, let us be clear on that. Because it has a huge global impact in terms of a disequilibrium I was speaking about. Uh, so we would wish that Europe finds a way of uh, dealing with its security, rebuilding its security, but also finding a way of engaging with Russia. Also, against, this is also against the context of what is happening in Washington. There is a strong sentiment in Washington that Europe should now stand at its own, own feet and uh, look after its own security. This is not to degrade the NATO alliance, but th th that is a fact of life. The longer the Russia-Ukraine war continues, India and Europe will be competitors for the attention and resources of the United States of America. Now, if Europe wants to come to the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, a good beginning would be made by Europe looking after its own interests in Europe. On the Global South, let us be clear. Like India, there is widespread concern in the Global South on the violations of the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the Russia -Ukraine, Russia's uh, military aggression against Ukraine has definitely brought this up. But I don't think there is a buy-in in the Global South, including in India, in how the Western narrative has been framed on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. It was uh, that it was unprovoked, there was no previous history. And there were several instances of possibilities for peace, including after the commencement of hostilities, and these were, uh, this may not uh, be taken forward. On sanctions, let us be clear. The view in the Global South is that these sanctions are self-designed self by the West, self-approved by the West, self-exempted by the West, and implemented entirely in, in their own interests. So if you think that there is a buy-in on sanctions from the Global South, we are mere spectators and victims of a process we are not involved with, in the, in, in the defense of a higher ideal, I think you will have to strong, uh, you, have, you will have to try harder. Okay, thank you. Thank you, now, Ambassador Now, the last Thanks. question, I would like to add one on India. On the G20, I think if there is a common denominator of a sentiment on the Ukraine conflict, which includes a strong sentiment of, from, the G, from the Global South, I think the statement that was issued in the G20 uh, final document, I think, is a co very good common denominator, and it's a measure of India's success, uh, successful diplomacy in the, uh, in, in the G20 summit. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Foreign Minister, uh, a minute and a half on NATO, please. Thank you. On NATO, Trump. I was Defense Minister when Trump became first time president. And everybody was worried what will happen. And I agree with our uh, Ukraine colleague that uh, let's wait. It's a campaign right now. Let's wait what will happen. Because Trump is not alone, all the US. So uh, actually, when Trump became first time president, uh, our region gained more troops, more weapons, more tanks, and more military support and money. Second, about NATO. NATO is strong. NATO is solid, more prepared than ever before in our region. I can assure that because I know that. So this is, uh, this is the case. But uh, it's clear that the European side, these countries who are not putting 2% of GDP in, they must pay. And actually, it was a Trump's message as well, if I translate it. We must pay, exactly now. Estonia is putting 3.2% of GDP in. So we must understand, we must invest. And the third is that we have to deal with uh, renewing the <coughs> European uh, security architecture. It is clear it doesn't work. The principle of neutrality, as we call it, uh, gray zones, it doesn't work. It's like a green light for Russia. And the best proof is, of course, uh, Ukraine. And we are in a clear position. Ukraine must become the full member of NATO. NATO is the only, only working security guarantee. No other assurance is bilateral or trilateral. They doesn't work. They haven't worked, and they will not work. Business, as usual, never turns back. And the best proof of that is that Finland joined the NATO, but Finland is a bordering country. But Swedish people decided to join NATO after more than 200 years of neutrality. So then you can feel as well what, is, what our people are feeling about uh, the threat from Russia okay. So in Europe. So that's the case. NATO security guarantees invest more Let's run uh, the elections in US, 
uh, whoever wins, U.S. will remain, because it is existential question for U.S. society as well. And of course, it's unfortunate that U.S. has not this uh, political will right now to deliver 60 billion dollars support to Ukraine, but the European Union did it. Okay, 50 billion you. has done. Thank you. Thank you very much. We hear you, Minister. Um, okay, so um, I w we have time for two questions. One to you, please, Ambassador, and I want to offer one to the Raisina Young Fellows and the, la the, the lady over there. Raisina Young Fellow, come up. And then over to you, Ambassador. You get the second question. Yeah. Please uh, be brief. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. I am Yasemin, an academic from Turkey. Uh, the positions have been taken by the countries from Global South, such as Turkey or India or Brazil, uh, towards the Ukrainian war, have been conceived as kind of Cold War bipolarity, like as if uh, it is a war between democracy and authoritarianism. But don't you think it is more like fragmentation rather than polarization? And also, do you think the conflict in Ukraine or this kind of conflicts among superpowers becomes an opportunity for countries, uh, for emerging powers in the global south uh, to demonstrate their own relevance and ability to make independent decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take the second question, please. Um, a, a comment to um, Ambassador Verma and a question to the Romanian uh, Foreign Minister with whom I've had WhatsApp conversations that I have only met uh, today. First, to Ambassador Verma, the best way to think about the Russia-Ukraine war is to think about August 1990. In August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, claiming that Kuwait was the 19th province of Iraq and arguing that it was provoked by Kuwait's refusal to raise the oil price uh, to give more money to Saddam Hussein. Kuwait had no defense agreement with any country in the world. It invoked UN Article 51. 75 countries, more or less, came to the support of Kuwait. No one in what was then styled the Third World, now called perhaps the Global South, opposed Kuwait's uh, desire completely to recover its sovereignty with a single exception of Yasser Arafat's uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization. That's the way uh, to think about uh, this uh, conflict. And by the way, to his credit, George H.W. Bush had no long-term vision for Iraq. He just had the objective of helping Kuwait recover its sovereignty. It's Russia's obligation to have a long-term vision for itself. And my question to the Romanian foreign minister is that Jens Stoltenberg, the secretary general of NATO, has repeatedly said that NATO will defend every inch of NATO's territory. Does that include its maritime territory? And if it does, given that Romania does not have full sovereignty over its maritime coast because of Russian mines that are laid there, might you ever give consideration to at least talking about the invocation of Article 5 at NATO to protect your maritime uh, borders because freedom of the Black Sea depends on you being able uh, to protect uh, your own uh, coastline. And an open Black Sea would mean that the number one importer of uh, Indonesian wheat in the world, Egypt, and the number two importer of Indonesian wheat uh, in the world, uh, Indonesia, Thank would you. be able to maintain their food security. So that's the food security interest that the Global South should be supporting. Thank well. you. Thank you. So there are clear questions to Ambassador Varma and Foreign Minister of Romania. And uh, the first question, who would like to answer from our rising young fellow of our panelists? Why don't you start and one of you can answer the other one. The yeah, on the international impact, I think the renewed interest in BRICS is a good ind indication that there is a considerable disquiet in the international community on how uh, associations in, are taking, being taken forward as a direct result of the aftermath of the Russia-Ukraine war and how the West has dealt with it. On the question from Dr. Chapman, I completely understand your outrage, but I come back to my original point that outrage is not policy. Thank you. Foreign Minister of Romania, please. Well, um, the Article 5 is the core principle of uh, NATO alliance, and uh, uh, I think our objective now on the eastern flank is really to strengthen the deterrence and defense posture uh, uh, in, in the region, in the Black Sea, and this is, we are working with our allies. Uh, 
uh, with the uh, U.S., with uh, France and other partners in order to strengthen uh, and, uh, the capabilities and to increase the military presence on our territory. What we are doing also in the Black Sea, uh, because uh, one of the threats and the consequences of this war is uh, the mining, uh, the mines floating in the Black Sea. So we have signed recently an agreement with Turkey and Bulgaria for demining the Black Sea. So uh, we are working in this direction. Maybe uh, if I got the, the question correctly, I just want to underline uh, uh, or to answer uh, the, the first question. So the way also we see this war, war as I said it, when someone bluntly violates the international rule based order, the humanitarian law, everything, this is carefully watched by other actors, state or not non-state actors having uh, revisionist ambitions or disrupting uh, intention. So as simple as that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as we've thank got... I'm so sorry to interrupt. Time's up. Time's up. Yeah. Thank you so much to Please the entire me. panel. Please applaud them. Uh, a fantastic conversation this morning. Uh, if I could request the panel